I've done a lot of videos on the Bravely Default series on this channel, like 10 or 12 or 150 videos or something. I, I don't know. Every one of the mainline games I have done at least some kind of video on. But one thing I haven't really touched on in any extensive way is the spin-off games. So far, there have been four spin-off games released only in Japan, never to be translated and brought over to the West. And while Brilliant Lights has only just released and may have a chance of making it over, considering that we are now getting the mobile Octopath prequel this summer, the same cannot be said for the other three games. Bravely Default Fairy's Effect, Bravely Archive D's Report, and the game that this video is focused on are all now shut down, offline, almost completely lost to time. While we have some baseline information on each game, general premises and such, unless you played the game and could understand Japanese, their stories are more or less unknown. If only there was an archive for these games. So I found an archive for Praying Braj's plot. Upon the game's termination of service, Square Enix created this website, Bravely.jp, as an official archive for the game's contents. Bravely Default Praying Braj was a browser game that began its beta in 2012 and ended service in April of 2019. The archive has a complete character list, all main story quest dialogues, and a collection of promotional manga strips. We're not really going to be talking about the gameplay today, though if you want to see what it was like for yourself, I will be linking a playlist that shows an entire game playthrough. This video is going to be dedicated to going over the entire story of the game, all 135 quests. No quests have been cut, though I have tried to summarize each one as much as possible for the sake of brevity. Although considering how long this video is, probably didn't make much of a difference. So, it's probably best to pause the video now, go get yourself a snack and something to drink, because this is going to be a long one. Before we get into the plot of Praying Braj, there's a few things we need to go over. Firstly, this story is split into three volumes, as I will refer to them. You can see on the site that there are four pages to visit in the story section. This first one is just introductory stuff, which we will still be going over as the prologue, but I wouldn't count it as its own complete volume. Second, although this is going to cover the complete plot as provided from the archive, there is still some story missing. My assumption is that this plotline was part of the base game or the beta perhaps. The good news about this at least is that none of the missing story has any super significant bearing on the story I'm covering here. So when you hear the terms the Duke of Gelug, the Snake Messengers, or the Rovos party, just know that they aren't really pivotal to the plot they were just enemies that have been beaten in the past and are going to be mentioned here and there. Third, as was the case with the Bravely Default Anthology video, all the translating was just me using Chrome's built-in translation extension, so the English that came out was very broken. For dialogue that was a little too jumbled, I double-checked it through DeepL as well, and based on these two translators, I used my own understanding of the Bravely universe to piece this story together. I also cross-referenced scenes and events with the playthrough I mentioned earlier. However, there's still the likelihood that there are some errors, but I believe I've gotten the plot down for the most part. Fourth, there are going to be returning characters from the previous Bravely games. Except for a select few, most of them are summoned. From what I can tell, these are not technically the same people, but they have their memories and personalities. They're reconstructions, basically, so just keep that in mind. And finally, if you enjoy this video, please be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons. This took a lot of work to bring this video to fruition, and any and all support is thoroughly appreciated. Thank you. Alright, that's all the introductory stuff out of the way. Without further delay, I present Bravely Default, Praying Braj. The game begins with a history lesson from Seleno, a crystal officer who is a recurring NPC in the game.
She explains that 200 years after the events of the first Bravely Default, the southern ocean of Luxendark is evaporated by the Holy Pillar, summoned by the Bringer of Ruin. The four crystals of earth, water, fire, and wind were shattered and spread across Luxendark. Great and terrible thunderclouds formed that blotted out the sun, beginning a decade of black rains and roaring thunder. Survivors abandoned the flatlands. The lands of Luxendark then began to separate from the surface of the world and begin disintegrating as they rose into the atmosphere. First were the cliffs west of Florum, then the northern region of Isenberg. Over the next century, many portions of Luxendark are lost. Four plains, eight highlands, three oceans, and two continents. Fifty years before present day in Praying Braj, members of a group claiming to be the Crystal Orthodoxy land on the rising continent via airships and plant a crystal piece from gathered fragments in the ground. The continent stops rising and settles in the sky above the thunderclouds. This continent is named Crystallica. The organization then used their airships to deliver people from the dying Luxendark to the new promised land of Crystallica. The Orthodoxy then planted crystals in four more of these rising islands, appointing a vestal to each. These four islands are Windren, home of the wind crystal, Odina, home of the water crystal, Ignis, which houses the crystal of fire, and Petrania, land of the crystal of earth. The new society there embraced crystal faith. Artificial crystal production, also called the Law of the Crystal, was developed, and the decline of the crystal power within Crystallica was halted. The Anchor Obelisk was also developed, allowing the people to halt the ascent of any new islands and secure them at a stable height, allowing for the nation's expansion as well as the collection of resources and crystal fragments. And such is the state of Crystallica as we begin our story. When the game starts, you are greeted by Ari, who serves as your guide and companion throughout the entire game. She does most of the talking on behalf of the player. Afterwards, the player chooses one of the four Vestals to follow. These are the candidates. Edia Lee Oblige, Vestal of Wind. Having taken the place of the previous Vestal after her mysterious disappearance, Edia is our main character. She doesn't really have a feel for the whole governing thing, so when she tries to persuade you into following her, she doesn't ask for much, only that you act on your beliefs and what you think is right, which is good enough for her. This is also the same idea from Bravely Default and Bravely Second. How she ended up 200 years in the future, we'll touch on later. Iglia Ningva Oblige, Vestal of Fire. Iglia is a very straightforward and hot-headed person. Having a bit of a short temper, but extremely brave, Iglia seems to seek power and complete victory over the enemies of Crystallica. The artist's note in the Bravely Default art book from Akihiko Yoshida also mentions that he was told to give her a large chest and that this was as comfortable as he felt going with. Lilia de Rosso Oblige, Vestal of Earth. The youngest of the vessels, Lilia seeks to uphold her family lineage, that of the De Rosso royal line, from the times before Eternia was a duchy and still a kingdom. She wants to restore the kingdom of Eternia here in Crystallica to its former glory and do her ancestors proud. Whether she actually is a descendant of Lester De Rosso is still yet to be seen. She also hates to be treated like a child. Curie Oblige, Vestal of Water the final of the four Vestals, Curie is an intellectual prodigy. Given the chance to study at a young age by the Orthodoxy, Curie is incredibly gifted and was actually the one to develop both the method of artificial crystal creation as well as the anchor obelisk. As thanks for giving her that chance as a youth, Curie wishes for her disciples to have unwavering faith in crystallism, and by extension, the Orthodoxy. Her name also kept translating to Cucumber Oblige. Whichever Vestal you choose to follow, however, the story to come remains the same. And thus, we move on.
the player and Aerie arrive at the Grand Temple of Crystallica that has recently been attacked. It has taken severe damage, and Seleno and Maya want the duo to find people to help defend the temples. They recommend visiting each of the Shrine Maidens and getting people based on their suggestions, especially since it would mean that those hired would have nothing to do with the current power struggle between the Pope and the Archbishop. At the Temple of Water, Curie recommends the Flower Knights, a group of five girls who are unrivaled in cuteness and are at the temple right now. Though they are good fighters, Curie warns that they still have youthful tendencies. We meet the first Flower Knight, Soru, all alone. Eri asks where the others are, and Soru says she has lost the others, and drags you two along to find them in a nearby forest. Two members of the group, Puri and Haraline, are found in some ruins, trapped by some toxic monsters, and combat occurs. After the battle, Puri and Haraline were left poisoned by the monster, but it cannot seem to be healed by conventional matters. Just then, Elva appears with a serum to cure the poison. As a member of the State Forestry Corps, he warns everyone that the ruins have been made off-limits because of the monsters. Returning to the Water Temple, Kiri thanks the duo for their work, but Sheena and Azamara are still missing after they went chasing after a Prince of Destiny. She also states that the ruins have been made off-limits by the Pope as well as the Forestry Corps. The duo are sent to find the last two Flower Knights, Sheena and Azamara, who both went chasing after the same man after they fell in love with him. They go searching around Odina and find Azamara, who appears to be in a trance-like state and is unresponsive. She then runs away again, and the group chases after her. Cut to Sheena and a man named Jay speaking about the ruins. Jay states that they were empty, but he has found something interesting. When Azamara returns, Jay states that she couldn't resist his medicine extracted from the creature. When the group arrives, Harolin claims that Jay is the one who cheated on Sheena in the past. Jay says that Azamara came to him willingly, and then he used his drug to control her, and then did the same to Sheena when she tried to save her sister. He then makes them attack the party. After battle, Eri demands the antidote from Jay, but he won't hand it over. He wishes that they would call him a tactician before trying to depart. He is interrupted, however, by Anheria Venus, who calls him out on controlling women and using them like objects. She knocks the antidote from his hands, which prompts him to flee. Sheena and Azimara are given the antidote and recover. Now that the Water Temple has been reinforced, you visit the Fire Vestal, Iglia. She states that this whole plan is just a way of using you, to which Aerie retorts that she's still following along too. Iglia wants the duo to keep the Dragon Busters intact as they are falling apart. They are specialists in one specific field at the Crystallica Magic Academy, and their teamwork is said to result in power capable of defeating dragons. Eri then rushes off to get started, even though it's clear Iglia hasn't finished saying everything. Arriving in Ignis, Alm is informed of the request, as Cheryl is shouting in the next room over. When asked about the problem, Alm explains that the Dragon Busters are falling apart. Delil, the elder sister of the Kamu twins, is extremely lazy, and her sister Cheryl takes care of everything for her sister, almost obsessively so. Cheryl is loved by the professors as well, but Delil has higher potential when she decides to do something. Because of their fighting, no research is getting done, and the Academy may force the Dragon Busters to dissolve. Alm wants the duo to specifically find Delil, who has gone missing in a valley. The duo find Delil near a cliff and have to fend off a demon attack. Before Delil and Eri fall, Milosa of the Forestry Corps arrives to save them, saying that the area is too dangerous. Arriving back at the academy, Cheryl is in a flurry over Delil taking off like that, but the latter reveals it was to get Cheryl her favorite rare flower from the area as a thank you for taking care of her. With two of the Dragon Busters returned, Alm wants you to find the remaining two, Krista and Rias, in a cave of the Earth Dragon to the east. In the cave, they encounter D, who attacks them. Krista uses Faraga, but it is ineffective as D's attribute is fire. The duo arrive, and Eri asks what D is doing there. When he won't answer, Eri moves to attack, but the rumbles of the Earth Dragon take precedence, and battle begins with the Beast. After the battle, the dragon still lives, but Krista calms it down. 
then collects some eggshell pieces from the area. Rius explains that the shell has magical properties they can use in their research, which is why they came here in the first place. They then all return to the academy. Reporting back to Iglia, she's curious of Dee's intentions and how Christus Faraga didn't even harm him. She also notes that the cave was formerly the burial site of a high priest of the Orthodoxy. After having experienced Jay's mind control drugs, Aerie decides to find Fiore de Rosa to learn more on the subject and see if he was involved. Bumping into Leem, she reveals that illicit drugs have been spreading throughout Crystallica recently, and that she has been searching for de Rosa as well. The three decide to party up. Meeting with Leem's fellow city guard, Jamie and Olga, they investigate a warehouse where de Rosa is suspected to be. Inside, de Rosa is meeting with Camellia, and seems to be selling her drugs, despite her supposedly being part of the town help unit Aoi no Otome. The party interrupts the deal, but the Aoi no Otome members reveal that De Rosa was helping them set up a sting operation to catch the real criminals, and because the party interrupted, the whole thing is ruined now. Afterwards, Aerie shows De Rosa the concoction Jay used, and he informs her that he was not the creator, but can tell that it was made from the body fluids of a demon beast that was nestled in some forest. He also states that a drug like this, used too many times, would kill someone. Seleno and Maya call the duo to go find the missing Crystal Orchestra, who undertook an unauthorized trip to a newly emerged island that was once a part of Northern Florum. It is said that the grave of a former composer, Canadel Utrecht, is there, and that sheets of Utrecht's lost music were buried there. The duo are accompanied to the island by Grela, a member of the Forestry Corps, who is setting up base camp on the new island. The duo hear music being played, which eventually leads them to finding two members of the orchestra, Mew and May, under attack by a demon beast. After saving them, they all return to base camp. Grela takes care of an injured member of the orchestra, then points out that the new floating island is still not safe considering they don't know what monsters could have come up from the surface of Luxendark. Aerie offers that the two of you will go searching for the remaining three, who are probably at Utrecht's grave, and Grela gives you a flare in case you need help. The duo find the remaining three musicians, Aria, Holland, and Link, quietly discussing how to get into the graveyard, since there's a giant snake blocking the way. Suddenly, E appears, another member of J and D's group, and awakens the serpent, running past into the grave while leaving the others outside to die or be eaten. The group battles the serpent, but when they can't defeat it, Arya uses her music to calm it down and put it back into a slumber. E returns from the grave, stating she has found what she came for, and that all that was left were the music sheets. She hands them over to the musicians, but claims that now she will be their enemy from now on. Eri uses the flare to signal Grela for help, but E flees before reinforcements arrive. The sheets are revealed to have been written by Utrecht III. Idea Oblige calls the duo to help after she receives an urgent letter from Kami Izumi asking for help. She wishes to join you, but Melopi reminds her of her position, as well as all the paperwork she has to do as a Vestal, which Idea hates. Upon arriving, Kami Izumi is surrounded by apprentices. When confronted, he explains that in order to make ends meet, he decided to start instructing people in the martial arts. However, since the current fad is the way of the ninja, he got Kikyo on board. Eri says that getting Kikyo was a good call, especially with putting her on posters because she's a pretty girl. And Kami Izumi blushes. When Eri asks where Kikyo is, the facade is dropped, and Kami Izumi reveals herself as Kikyo in disguise. She was the one to send the letter, and currently Kami Izumi is away visiting Brave Lee. When she resumes the disguise, she explains that as Kikyo, she is shy and finds it hard to teach. The apprentices begin to get impatient, wanting to know where Kikyo is, and he announces that the final exam will happen. All they have to do is beat the duo. Iris of the Aoi no Otome approaches and battles you. After the battle, Kami Izumi returns, scolds Kikyo lightly for her mischief, and welcomes the others as his new pupils. Returning to Idea, the situation is explained, and Idea opens a letter Kami Izumi sent her, asking for permission to use her approval of his business as a Vestal and former student as a promotional point. Prison Break! 
Kamer has escaped from Crystallica prison, and the Ali no Otome need your help recapturing him. It's believed he had help getting out, and there were reports of an exotically dressed swordsman. The group goes hunting and think they found the swordsman, but accidentally ruin the hunt of Steina and Georges from the city guard. Away from the party, Kamer and Kint are still on the run. As they take a short break, Kamer asks why Kint is bothering to save him, considering he only works for pay. He holds up a tin doll, something the children played with in the streets, and he said they wanted him to break Kamer out, believing that he wasn't that bad of a person. Kint then tells Kamer that they are in a different time and place now, and that they aren't tied to their behaviors from 200 years prior. Kamer asks if Kint's changed, and he replies that the tin doll is his payment now, and that even though before he would only work for money, it was probably that child's treasure. Rumors of your heroics have been spreading, according to Idea. She then asks if it is her time to choose a group to help defend Crystallica. She brings up a treasure hunting unit named Trezo Advent, and reveals that they are already on their way to the temple. Lena, Lapis, Firefly, and Cologne all introduce themselves. Idea then explains that after their last exploit into a labyrinth southeast of Windren, their leader Sunny didn't return. She asks that you go help them find Sunny. With the Trezo Advent leading the duo through the labyrinth, using their treasure hunter skills to avoid traps and the like along the way, they are attacked by a demon. Afterwards, they encounter Sunny with a mysterious man who apparently helped her while she was trapped down in the labyrinth. The man then glares at Eri for a moment, saying that she reminds him of someone he once knew. The group begins to head out, and Eri notices the mysterious man's right arm is prosthetic. You regroup with the rest of Trezo Advent as they are fighting off a demon, and after the fight, you appears, another of the blue group. She then reveals the second demon, and the first that was slain rises again. Yu explains that as long as one remains alive, the other will come back, and you can play with them for as long as you like. The party then defeats both of the demons at the same time with the help of the mysterious man, who frightens you into retreating. Reporting back to Idea, Eri makes a note that you reminded her of Idea, at least in looks. Ivy Beth Bliege, the Pope of the Orthodoxy, calls on the duo for a super secret mission. Delivery person. She wants some sweets, booze, and food delivered to Templar Brave Lee on the shores of Lake Sumase Maseia. Eri is greatly surprised by this since Brave was previously charged with an attempted assassination of Iglia. Ivy Beth claims the package is just a sign of friendship to one who once ruled a nation. At the arranged location, Heinkel is also there and rifles through the goods, very excited about them. Alternus is a bit more cautious, thinking it may be a trap of some sort. Brave asks if there was a message from the Pope, and after Eri relays, are there any changes, Brave explains that she's probably just telling him to be careful. He also says that being in this lakeside house that Idea set up for him has been calm, but boring. Heinkel then jokes that it'd be nice to have all five of the Duchy swordsmen together for a drink, and suddenly Kami, Zumi, and Kint arrive. Kint apologizes to Brave, saying that he's changing now as a person, and felt before that he didn't deserve to stand before the Grand Marshal. Brave says that was never the case. Now that they are all together though, the five swordsmen wish to do battle with you. After a long and difficult fight, the swordsmen all relax and share drinks with each other. Returning to Ivy Beth, she thanks you and is glad the Templar is well, and announces that the same foods have been prepared for you. She then pauses to say something else, but changes her mind and leaves you. Sakuya is an official known as the Momoaki, and needs help getting the city guard and Aoi no Otome to get along. The entire reason they are fighting comes from when Sakuya received the position in the first place. Both groups made her sweets, but when she wouldn't eat either, the two groups started insulting each other's sweets, which grew into the current conflict. The reason she wouldn't eat is that she is on a diet. Eri proposes that the two groups have a bake-off in an abandoned temple, with the loser having to listen to the winning group. Both sides agree, and Steina bakes for the city guard, while Sakura bakes for the Aoi no Otome. The judges are announced, Holly White, Verda Luzin of the Forestry Corps, and a random third woman named G of the Blue Group. 
Aerie is shocked when she sees G, but G explains that Aerie's staff let her in. She then goes on about how under the temple there was a cave with a shrine she was looking for. G then admits to waking up a demon beast and having it chase her back to the surface, at which moment it breaks through the floor as G takes off. The battle and post-match dessert eating allows the two groups to reconcile and recognize that they are both different but can complement one another. After telling Sakia what happened, she reveals that she was supposed to be the mystery third judge. Seleno and Maya then appear, and after hearing about the troubles that Sakia has caused, decide to punish her with making her eat all the dishes the two groups prepared, as well as enforcing her exercise routine so she can maintain her weight. Sakuya is crushed and prays for forgiveness. Now it's Lilia's turn to pick out guardians for Crystallica's defense. She decides on the Forestry Corps, as she's a big supporter of theirs and likes how they work. She names off the members she wants, including a new name, Willen. Suddenly, Elva arrives, stating that Willen needs help, and so Lilia sends the duo with him. Arriving at the headquarters of Forresta Saber, they find Willen inside with a plant attached to her head, speaking in strange ways about worshipping the forest while surrounded by vines and ivy. Elva explains he found this plant in a forest recently, and that the plant attaches itself to animals and controls them until it gets to an area ideal for growth, such as having sunlight or being near water, at which point it detaches and sets the animal free. Unfortunately, the plant is absorbing Willen's magic and is growing at an exponential rate. The group fights the plant to remove it, and once it's detached, Willen comes back around. Upon returning to Lilia, Airy reports that she planted the parasitic plant in the Earth Temple's garden, claiming that it poses no threat as long as you don't have immense empathy or magic power like Willen. She also informs Lilia that the plant bears delicious fruit that aristocrats used to trade the fruit's weight in gold for. Seleno and Maya gather the groups organized by the Vestals to make their partnership in the Crystallica Defense Treaty official. The groups do step forward and make the two promise them that they will not be dragged into the current power struggle between the Pope and the Archbishop, that they will only be used to defend Crystallica and all of her people regardless of power or faction. Seleno and Maya accept this. Maya then asks that the duo go inform Idea immediately about the treaty being made official since she was particularly concerned on this matter. Ari agrees and the two leave. While on the way to Windrin, the party comes across members of the Blue Group confronting the mysterious man from before. Aerie demands to know why they're bothering him, but when they tell her to leave, combat ensues against D, G, and J. Once they are beaten, the Blue Group retorts how much stronger the player and Aerie have gotten. Afterwards, they take off, and the duo approaches the mysterious man. Aerie asks for the man's name, and he states that he left it behind in the distant past. He then hands the player a treasure chest with no discernible keyhole and asks that they deliver it to Idea Lee. No, Idea Lee Oblige. Ari asks what's in the box, and the man says that it means nothing to anyone alive, but to those who deceive time and live a vacant life, it would be worth trading everything for. The man also notes how funny the situation is him trusting a fairy with the box, considering he was deceived by one in the past. He then takes his leave. When they meet with Idea, they give her the box and explain everything. Idea seems troubled by this and can't seem to believe the man's words about a deceiver of time. Ari also asks if Idea was ever done wrong by a fairy. Hilarious. On Notatsuko Beach, an island that is summertime all year long, the Flower Knights want the duo's help in dealing with perverts eyeing up girls on the beach. You and Ari approach a group of guys with a video camera and get into a fight with them, but then they reveal that they're part of the marine research group from the Magic Academy and have been filming sea creatures. Ari confiscates the camera and sends them on their way. Melope calls for the duo to check up on Idea, who has been acting strangely. She hasn't been eating all her meals the last few days and has been gorging herself on knowledge in the library, endlessly searching through the books for something. When you visit her, she's mumbling about what she's reading. It seems to be themed around the separation of ground from Luxendark rising into Crystallica, but then turns to you and asks for help with something else, catching a book thief. Going to a secondhand bookstore, Idea confronts a bad priest 
who has been stealing works from the temple library and selling them. After battling the store workers, it's revealed that the store is a front for a black market smuggling job, and the priest was just trying to make some more cash on the side, not knowing it was a smuggling place. Idea still arrests him anyway. Afterwards, Idea is still heavily invested in her research, saying, Agnes, I'll definitely find it. Lilia has been eyeing a creepy old mansion to live in for her own sake of privacy and wishes for the duo to accompany her. Walking through the place, it seems to be haunted, but Lilia loves it. Suddenly, in a back room, Lilia goes blind. A man steps out from the darkness and explains that it's a curse for people who enter the castle that aren't welcome. A battle ensues, and the duo are victorious. Lilia demands to know where the enemy is, and when Ari tells her to hide due to her blindness, Lilia refuses, protesting that Lilia de Rosso Oblige does not hide. The man repeats her name, seeming to realize what this means, and suddenly his demeanor changes to one of calmness. The man says that the curse will lift with time, but only grow more painful if Lilia rubs her eyes. He then states that he is glad Lilia is not lonely in the world, and apologizes, never wishing to cause the trio pain. The duo lead Lilia out of the mansion, but as soon as Eri turns back, the mansion has disappeared. Back at the temple, Tegate enters with a portrait Lilia commissioned. When seen by Eri, Lilia reveals that the man in the painting is her ancestor, Lester de Rosso, the man they saw in the mansion. Astrope, servant to the Water Vestal, tells the duo that a secret meeting is being held between Curie and the Archbishop Rowan Cristalia V in a private residence near Lake Faranui. Not even Maya is aware of this meeting. Astrope also informs them that Iglia sends spies out to each of the other factions for information, and that the consequences of her learning about this meeting could be bad. As a guard would be too obvious, Astrope asks that the duo listen in on the meeting. In their conversation, Rowan tells Curie that she came personally because she cannot promise that the temple would offer complete secrecy for their talk, and that the Pope cannot know of it. Before the duo can listen in, however, the duo bumps into a group of spies, Laura, Belial, and Shun Suk, who were also beneath the floor to hear the conversation. After a fight erupts, the spies take off, and Rowan thinks she hears something. Curie returns the Archbishop's attention to their talk by asking if what she just said was true. Rowan reminds Curie of how they escaped the last catastrophe on Luxendark, then says that up here in the clouds, they will not be able to escape the next one, and that the Crystal Orthodoxy must protect Crystallica at any cost. Curie hesitantly says she understands, but when Rowan follows it up with saying that she'll have to ask Lilia next if Curie can't do it, the Water Vestal goes silent. After the meeting, Astarope tells the duo that whatever Curie was told has perturbed her greatly, and that she has sealed herself away, even drinking to cope. The duo confront Fire Vestal Iglia about her spying on the meeting with the Archbishop. She claims they have no proof of that, and that every Vestal spies on each other, including Curie. When Eri points out that she never said the meeting was between the Archbishop and Curie, Iglia is caught out. Eri demands to know what her spies reported to her on what Rowan said, but before she can tell her, a Temple of Fire Guard arrives with urgent news. A fire has broken out in the Temple Laboratory. Inside, a fire creature they were testing with had broken free. Eri asks why they do such dangerous research, and Iglia replies that if one never repairs for the worst, they'll fall when it comes. The duo defeats the fire creature, and Electra offers clean clothes and other comforts, as ordered by Iglia. Ari still wants to talk with the fire vestal, but she's nowhere to be found. Later, Iglia is speaking with Ivy Beth, the Pope. She seems to be informing Iglia of the Archbishop's intentions. When Iglia asks Ivy Beth what she should do, the Pope tells her not to cause a turmoil and just be patient for now. She also says that the good guys may do something that will be beneficial to them. Dione wants to hold a meeting for the Acura group, but because she's 200 years old, she fears that the place she chooses won't be hip enough for the younger members. Therefore, she wants the duo to go check out a new seafood restaurant in town. The place is operated by Barbarossa, Barris Lair, and Praline Alamode. They argue a fair amount and don't always get the right orders out to the customers, but after battling the duo, they come together as comrades. They also drag you and Ari along for drinks. 
Selena calls on the duo to go investigate a supposedly hidden mansion where Duke Gellig was hiding, the person behind an assassination attempt on the Archbishop. Harry complains of her sore throat from the night out previously, and Selena offers her concoction to soothe it. It works instantly, and Selena said the treatment was a favorite of the first Momoaki. At the mansion, the duo don't find any signs of the Duke, but they do encounter G, who just happened to be there as well for no reason. Demon beasts appear, and when Eri calls them thus, G scolds her, saying they didn't want to be demon beasts. After fighting them off, G leaves. Reporting back, Eri pulls out the video orb she got from the marine research group to show a recording of G. Seleno is shocked as she claims that G looks very similar to the first Momoaki, Uzume, who never had children. Idea is still heavily invested in scouring the Wind Temple Library for answers. When she still can't find any answers, she decides to go check the Central Temple's library and has the duo tag along to help her. After staying up late with no success, Idea invites them to come with her to a late night store for some food. As they make their way there, the three are set upon by three ninjas, Madra, Morin, and Emeralda, who attempt to kill Idea. The Wind Vestal is weak from not eating the last few days, and so the duo has to fend off the attack. They succeed in the end, and Idea has the three turned over to local authorities. After returning to the Wind Temple and telling Melope what happened, Eri further explains that the Inquisitor they handed the three ninjas over to turned out to be fake, and neither he nor the ninjas have been found since. Lilia calls on the duo's aid as she heads into Voe Swamp to pick a water lotus for Curie, who has still been in a depressive state. In the swamp, the duo fend off a water dragon, and Lilia gets down deep into the mud to safely pluck the lotus to keep it from dying. Lilia and the duo go straight to Odina to deliver the flower to Curie. When they arrive, Lilia recalls a story to Curie of when the water vestal once told her how the water lotus roots spread deep into the mud, and the dirtier the water, the more purified and beautiful the flower will become, and that this is how the shrine maidens must also be. This memory sparks a smile from Curie, and she thanks Lilia for the gift. After they leave, Curie speaks to herself of how she cannot Lilia become involved in this mud, and that the girl might even hate her for what she's doing in the future. The Dragon Busters come to the Wind Temple to visit Idea, who they've heard is still deep in research. Though she is busy, the duo received the message that the mysterious man was spotted in a distant village on the former Eternian mountain range. When the duo arrive, they are told by the village elder that the man was indeed there and fended off a great monster with his massive sword. Then he stayed for three nights and left with his companion who, while being bad-mouthed and erratic, fixed the village's water wheel and made it run better than ever. Back in Ignis, Cheryl and Delil ask why Iglia sent the Dragon Busters to visit Idia, to which she claimed she didn't want the Wind Vestal knowing she was involved. After they leave, Iglia debates her next move. While in the main city, the duo and the Aoi no Otome witness a massive group of mercenaries forming outside of the main Crystal Temple, claiming that they are ready to make a Shrine Maiden their enemy. Their organizer is showing up soon, so the duo battles the group. Afterwards, Iglia arrives and reveals herself as the organizer, as she is preparing for if she needs to fight against the other Vestals. The Aoi no Otome can't do anything about this since they do not have jurisdiction in this area. Meanwhile, word of this display has reached Rowan's ears through Maya. When Maya offers to send a message to the Pope, Rowan declines, deciding to hold off on any action wanting to see what Iglia is up to. Idea calls the duo to the Wind Temple as she has made a discovery related to Group Blue. All of the ruins they have been visiting are 200 years old. Therefore, it is assumed that someone may have left something in one of these ruins for the future, and Group Blue is searching for it. There is another ruin they haven't been to yet, a place called Rigid Shrine in the Mukosuke Valley. Eri proposes they get there first to encounter Group Blue again. Sure enough, E and J are at the site, and E seems bitter about losing the box to the mysterious man. Eri confronts them, and battle ensues. After beating them yet again, E loses it and is about to unleash some great magic spell, but is interrupted by Ominous Crow coming out and asking what is going on. 
he seems to recognize Ominous, but can't get the words out from shock. Group Blue flees, and the duo talk to Ominous. He has been living in Rigid Shrine ever since Barris Lair abandoned his massage therapy store that he'd set up there. Ominous has been holding on to a book he left. Airy also points out a picture of Bahamut on the wall, and Ominous claims he drew it. Returning to Idea, she is disappointed that nothing really came of the venture, but she recounts her time under Ominous's command, as well as feeding food to Bahamut. The duo goes to Sakuya at her request to save her from her continuing exercise punishment, currently being conducted by Alcone. In exchange for getting her out of exercise duty, Sakuya offers to answer their questions about the first Momoaki, and only if they get her out. Eventually, they slip Sakuya away to a cake shop, where she enjoys some sweets while telling Eri about the history of the Momoaki. The role of the Akira in the first place was to give directivity to the power of the crystals, whereas the Vestals are the ones who create that power in the first place through prayer. Sakuya relates this to cakes. If eggs, wheat, milk, and sugar are the components that make crystals power, and the Vestal is the chef, then the Akira are the measuring devices. In the past, there were priests who would do the same thing in the temples, but now, with such a heavy reliance on crystals everywhere in Crystallica, the Akira were founded to do this job. The first Momoaki was chosen at this time too, Uzume, a summoner that existed about 150 years ago. Uzume was said to be so powerful that she had mastered the ability to summon Amaterasu. Uzume also worked with George to create the summoning ritual, assumed to be how characters are brought back from the past. Suddenly, Alcone appears, knowing Sakuya would come to the shop, and drags her back to her duties. Idea has taken off alone to investigate another new set of ruins in search of Anya's, so Melope asks that the duo hurry after her to make sure she's okay. When they catch up, Idea is being escorted by Kyori and her subordinates, as the ruins are within the Water Temple's jurisdiction. When Idea asks how much further, Kyori says it's only a little more, to which Idea shoots back that she may as well have her killed now. Eri is taken aback by Idea's words, which prompts the Wind Vestal to reveal the truth. It was Kyori who had tried to have Idea killed back in the city previously, as ordered by the Archbishop. Idea suggests that the order was given because the Dysnomia overheard her say unsavory things, but when she asks Kyori for the reason, she says she can't answer. Adia asks if her death will somehow save Crystallica, and Curie confirms this before beginning battle with her. With Curie defeated, Adia compliments her on how loyal her subordinates are. Curie doesn't understand, saying every other Vestal is more charismatic than herself. She goes on to say that Adia could lead an army of millions, which Adia states she did something similar in the past. Curie claims this is why she must kill Adia, and that after she was dead, Curie would kill herself. Eri tells Curie that she's no match for Dia and pleads for her to stop, but Curie's resolve is unshakable and she attacks again. Idea strikes her down, but informs her subordinates that it was non lethal. Idea then plans to go into hiding, avoiding the Temple of Wind. Back at the temple, Melope is informed by Wally that Iglia and her forces are invading Windrun. Melope calls for a defense of the land and to hold out until Idea returns. A meeting is held between the members of the Crystallica Defense Treaty, and they decide not to intervene in the current situation in Windrun. Idea is hiding out in the instrument warehouse of the Crystal Orchestra. She suspects that Iglia may be after the box that the mysterious man gave to her, and wants to get it out of the temple, but all transport in and out of Windrun has been blocked. Eri then recalls a secret passage she saw Idea using once to get out of work, and proposes using that to obtain the box. Following the passage, the duo meets with Melope and pass along a message from Medea that she is fine before grabbing the box and heading out. As they try to escape, however, a few of Iglia's mercenaries spot them and want the box, so a fight erupts. They are easily beaten, but then D appears and demands the box. Before he can do anything, however, Iglia uses Faraga on him, and this time it seems to actually have an effect. She asks if Eri has the box, and then proclaims that everything is going as planned as she lets the duo escape. D challenges Iglia to see whose fire is stronger, but then Iglia calls him by his full name, DCM2552. Surprised by this, he accepts her invitation to see someone who wants to meet him. 
With the box brought to safety, Idea believes that it is the center of everything that is going on. Iglia calls for the duo, as she wishes to make them a messenger. She does not want the innocent Cillians of Windrun to suffer, and as such is offering to have a truce to allow a convoy deliver supplies into Windrun, as well as allow any who want out to escape. Reporting back to Adia, she agrees to this, and also plans to sneak inside to check up on her troops and boost their morale. As the caravan approaches Windrun, Iglia's mercenaries stop the carriage, and Iglia demands an inspection of the supplies, knowing that Idea is on board. This turned out to be her plan all along, to lure Idea out, but not to kill her. Instead, Iglia explains that the blockade was done to protect Windren from the Archbishop, as the Pope made Iglia aware that Roanne wants Idea dead. When Idea asks why the Archbishop wants her dead, Iglia says that her existence is key to the return of the Demon King. Idea seems familiar with this foe. Iglia goes on to explain that the Archbishop cannot stop the danger to come, and that the Pope wants to bundle everyone together. Eri asks if this means killing the Archbishop, and when Iglia confirms this, the fairy denies her, saying that she likes the other Vestals just the same. Iglia grows frustrated and tries to punish Eri. After the battle, Iglia is surprised by the outcome, and orders that the convoy continues to the city to deliver its supplies. Eri asks Idea about the Demon King, and she explains that it is a general term for the incarnation of destruction that came from the Starfrost 200 years prior, and that if the Demon King returns now, it will destroy Crystallica. With Iglia's actions deviating from the Pope's original intentions, Idea wishes for the duo to secretly visit the Pope and get her to stop Iglia from attacking the Archbishop and the other Vestals. At a secret meeting, Ivy Beth is meeting with Group Blue about an island that will be rising up from Luxendark soon. Jay calls it Maujima. The group seems to mistrust Ivy Beth about something, but she promises things will be fine. After they leave, Ivy Beth calls for Aerie to come out, knowing she was there. Aerie demands to know the truth, and Ivy Beth asks if she's sure, for once one knows the truth, they can no longer be a bystander in the situation. Aerie accepts that, but Ivy Beth still wishes for her to prove she can handle the truth through combat. After losing, Ivy Beth explains that the catastrophe that destroyed Luxendark and made it uninhabitable was explained away by the Crystal Orthodoxy as being caused by a natural disaster. But the truth is that it was caused by the invasion of the Demon King that came from beyond the stars. It was so powerful, it even destroyed the crystals and it's still destroying the world to this day. On top of that, the Demon King is currently unbeatable, and the people of Crystallica can run no further in the skies. As well, resources are depleting, and the population cannot continue to be supported like this forever, which means needing to defeat the Demon King. And thus was the purpose of the Crystal Guard, Group Blue, they were created long ago by the Orthodoxy to battle against the Demon King, and now the island where the Devil was sealed away on is beginning to rise towards Crystallica. As the duo enter Petrania, they find many groups of refugees. Eric, one such refugee, explains that he's actually from Ignis, as both Windrun and Ignis citizens were afraid of a full-on war between their nations. As for Odina, Curie is currently silent and not getting involved in the situation. Lilia approaches the duo and asks them for help guarding supply convoys as they try to take in the refugees, and they agree. On the road, the caravan is attacked by bandits, but Yu of the Crystal Guard appears and kills some of the bandits. Eric thinks he recognizes the woman as Amarada, an ancient warrior of great repute, and she takes off. Once the duo returns, Lilia asks if they will go to Odina and check on the ill Curie. Astrope tells the duo that Curie has not left her room and continues to drink endlessly in seclusion, likely to subdue the guilt of trying to kill Idea. She goes on to state that it isn't necessarily a danger to Curie's health, considering her abundance of power over water to balance out the alcohol, but she hasn't been eating either, and the Vestal mumbles in her sleep, I'm sorry, forgive me. Reporting this to Adia, she suggests grabbing a specific kind of alcohol known as Hachiryu Killer, something so strong that it would break through Kyori's water protection and make her drunk, or at least affect her somehow. 
The only place they can obtain it, though, is from the Temple of Fire, but it is currently defenseless because of the blockade movement. Inside the temple, the duo find a few of Iglia's forces getting drunk on the stores of the temple, and end up fighting the drunk souls. Eri then finds the bottle of Hachirio Killer and delivers it to Kyuri. She comes out of the room gagging at the burn. Now with her in a compromised state, Eri tells Kyuri a message from Idea that she is forgiven, and that Idea too once did something she thought was right, only for it to nearly end the world. But after that, Idea decided to live on and carry her sins, so that meant that Curie could do it too. Curie accepts the words and begins to pick herself up, asking for a meal and a hot bath to rid herself of the alcohol. Curie explains that the Crystal Guard cannot fight the Demon King because it was sealed away, therefore depriving them of the opportunity to fight it. Now they want to break the seal, and Idea is the key. That is why Rowan wanted her dead. If the key was lost, the Demon King would never break free. Changing subjects, Curie wants the duo to head back to Petrania and try to help with the refugee crisis. Arriving at the Temple of Earth, Eri learns that Lilia has been summoned by the Archbishop for a mediation between the Ignis and Windrun forces and hurries to get to the meeting spot first. Once they get there, Eri begs Rowan not to tell Lilia about Curie's attempt on Idea's life. Rowan says that is not possible, as she is about to ask Lilia to be the next assassin. When asked why, she challenges the duo to battle, as she heard the Pope did. When defeated, Rowan states that the box is the key to freeing the Demon King, and that it can only be opened by something called a Lost Asterisk. In the past, it was an asterisk that was only possessed by those with the absolute strongest of will. Before the catastrophe, its existence was questioned, and in the years after, some tried to craft one. She then explains that Idea herself is an incarnation of the Lost Asterisk, and that no matter her intention, she could open the box. Rowan then goes on to say that the Crystal Guards are too dangerous if Idea is alive. What if they take hostages until Idea chooses to break the seal? The Archbishop is willing to sacrifice a thousand to save a million, and all of Crystallica and she's more than willing to end Idea if it saves a thousand. Rowan also states that once Kyori or Lilia kills Idea, she will take the blame and resign as Archbishop, giving the seat to one of them. A voice protests against this, and everyone turns to see Lilia step out of hiding, before crying and running off knowing what Rowan wanted of her. Eri then lets the Archbishop know that Kyori was hurting herself with booze over what she made her do, and Rowan only repeats, that it was all for the good of Crystallica. After being told about the lost asterisk, Idea speculates that it could be the Emperor asterisk, which would grant one the power to wage a war of rebellion on the entire world. She then suggests they go speak with her father, Brave Lee. Maybe the Pope sent that gift to see if he had the asterisk in the first place. Arriving at Brave's residence, they find Alternus being confronted by Dysnomia Inquisitors, who are accusing him and Brave of attempting to assassinate Iglia. Eri protests this is a lie, but the Inquisitors are not keen to listen and attempt to seize them. They obviously fail, but the fight is a draw. Just then, Brave arrives and tells them that he knows they are bending the law, and that if they wish to take him away, they're going to have to fight him. The Inquisitors retreat. Eri then asks Brave about the Lost Asterisk, and he says that he heard this term before from the old man who made them, likely say Juliana. The name of the asterisk was similar to Marshal or Emperor. When Idea finds out, she seems upset, which increases when Eri suggests she could lead the entire world. Instead, the Wind Vestal claims that had the catastrophe not occurred, that she would be the devil of her era. She then asks for some time alone to think. Lilia Oblige is still deep in despair at the reveal of the Archbishop's plans, and nothing seems to be cheering her up. Before the duo can come up with a solution, a bat flies through the temple window and leaves a message on the wall for them to come to Dondo Hill. At the location, Eri finds Lester de Rosso, Victor, and Victoria waiting for them. They immediately battle the duo, and when they lose, Lester gives them a letter for Lilia, then claims that seeing Lilia in that state makes him angry like a father for his sad daughter. When Lilia is given the letter, she recognizes the seal and opens it to begin reading. It was a letter of encouragement from Lester, telling her not to give up her humanity and that she was too young to sink into despair. To press forward with her pain was the way of the DeRosso name. 
This emboldens the Devoso heir, and she immediately recovers, demanding to know everything that has been going on. After informing Lilia about the Demon King's situation, she suggests they meet up with Kyuri and form an alliance of Earth and Water against Iglia. As they go to Odina, they are ambushed by Iglia's forces. Upon reaching the Temple of Water, Kyuri has done some research into the Crystal Guards and has made a shocking discovery. The information they were based on was fictional. A summoner summons people based on information about them from the past, and the more detailed the information, the more powerful the people are when summoned. So, with info as sophisticated as the real thing, people could be created from nothing. Some of the Crystal Guard were modeled after certain people in the past. Curie is still not sure why they weren't used yet in the actual battle, though. Now the group has to find a way to inform the Temple and stop the Crystal Guards. After relaying the new info to Adia, Ares states that they have no idea where the Demon King's Island will appear from. Adia then calls out to Seleno, who is listening in nearby. She reveals that Maojima is now at a visible altitude, and that Jay has had an effect on the Pope's hastiness through being a strong negotiator. The group realizes that since one would need to stay in Crystallica to fight the Demon King, the Crystal Guard's next move would be to take control of the Anchor Obelisk and make a run for it. J and G clear out the sight of guards just as the duo arrives, but before they can stop the guards, the demon beasts from Gelig's villa appear. After the battle, one of the beasts seems to whisper for death. J explains that the demon beasts are the failed experiments to create Crystal Guards, and that there are hundreds of them. Jay then leaves with G and the ejection device of the Anchor Obelisk. Maojima has risen, and demon beasts are growing more violent across Crystallica. The roads are splintered and broken, and new monsters are popping up out of the miasma that the Dark Island is releasing. A meeting is held amongst the Crystallica Defense Treaty members, but the main temple has no plans for action at the moment. The duo go out to a village to defend it against demon beasts, but afterwards Aerie is poisoned and near the brink of death. Just in time, Holly White appears to heal her, along with Barris Lair and the Jackal. They talk for a while, with Holly concluding that, in the past, they did bad things too, and the Orthodoxy, with all their power, did nothing when Brave Lee's hometown was being ruined by the Great Plague. When recounting this to Adia, she decides that there's only one course of action for her to take to give up her position as the Vestal of Wind. At the main temple's gates, civilians are begging to be let inside. Ivy Beth approaches the crowd of people and is informed by Seleno that Idea has made an appearance. The people beg for the Wind Vestal's aid, but Idea has an announcement to make. She publicly renounces her position as the Vestal of Wind, refusing to be part of a system that won't help its own people, and choosing to protect them as just Idea Lee. Both Rowan and Ivy Beth are outraged by this and demand that the Black Knights and the Blanca Corp seize her. The duo and Idea fend them off with their immense strength. Idea then states that she has no intention of destroying the Orthodoxy, but she will not recognize their ways any longer. She rallies the crowd in her favor, despite renouncing her position as Vestal. One by one, the various groups of the Defense Treaty side with Idea, wanting to protect Crystallica no matter what. Idea then asks for complete authority over Crystallica, so she can organize everything correctly to ensure its survival. Rowan declares it a coup d'etat, but Idea doesn't care. Ivy Beth, however, recognizes that Idea was very similar to her predecessor, Boria, and gives her the power she requests. Idea states that she used to be afraid of becoming a tyrant again, but that to have power and not act on it was just condemning her land to oblivion. And so, she will fight the Demon King. Idea immediately begins commanding the Orthodoxy soldiers, letting all the refugees into the temple and placing the armies around to defend against the demon beast's attacks. She then turns to the duo and claims that she needs them to go to Maojima and destroy the Anchor Obelisk. If this is done, then the island will begin to rise again and the miasma will pass over Crystallica. Upon reaching the island, they meet D, and Eri tries to convince him that their plan is wrong. D responds that he may be flawed, considering Patel made him. When Eri asks what he means, D explains that the scientist who made him was named Patel, a disciple of Georges, though he was of lesser skill and made many mistakes, before finally figuring out the fatal flaw in making crystal guards and disappearing into the forest. Eri then asks why he thinks he can win, 
and Dee responds by asking why she thinks winning is their goal. Before he can elaborate, the rest of the Crystal Guard show up. Dee states that he cannot die, and that they were made 200 years ago in the basement of the Gelling Villa. They also reveal that they have had one single purpose for their entire existence, and they cannot wait any longer to fulfill, to fight the Demon King. The battle ensues, and the Crystal Guards are defeated. Dee is surprised that someone other than the Demon King was able to beat him. Unfortunately, J and E reveal their failsafe. There was a crack in the barrier seal on the Demon King, from which the miasma poured, and the anchor obelisk was thrown inside of it. So if the duo wants to break the anchor, they have to release the Demon King now. The lines are beginning to falter against the demon beasts, and to make matters worse, Idea gets a report that Iglia's forces are headed for the temple, not in support, but to clear out the rebel. Ares suggests that you two go to deal with her. As Iglia's army moves, she encounters monsters from the Miasma, and the duo help defend against them. Towards the end of the battle, Alternus and Ominous appear to help out, with Curie and Lilia showing up not long after. They ask that Iglia disarm herself and come talk with Idea. She does so unwillingly. Idea asks why Alternus is here, and he explains that Brave sent everyone out to fight on the front lines, explaining the report of morale increase. Idea then asks Iglia for her aid, and when she first refuses, saying that Idea has betrayed the orthodoxy, Curie hits her, stating that the Pope authorized this state of affairs. The group fights for a bit more to make Iglia less stubborn, and finally she gives up and joins forces with them. Then Eri comments on Idea's chest, to which Idea says it's nothing like Iglia's, but it's perfectly average, before she notices the light coming from it. Alternus also says he cares not for size but for form. Idea tells him to shut up. The light coming from Idea makes her wonder how to turn it into an asterisk. Seleno, who is responsible for asterisks, only knows how to combine and retool them, but not how to make a completely new one. Then, E arrives and reveals that she is ready to fight the Demon King. She then reveals her true form, that of a Dagon like Bahamut, which Ominous believes is his pet. It's likely that E's model was that of Bahamut's ancestor. E prompts Idea to open the box, who is still hesitant, but Eri promises that everyone will be there to help her in battle. Idea commands the box to open, but instead of simply opening, it forms into a circle and out is summoned a familiar face, Magnolia Arch. Elsewhere, E returns to the Crystal Guards and tells them it's time to fight. The Magnolia that emerged from the box is a data copy, similar to the Crystal Guards. She was deployed when the box was opened to help aid in the Demon King's defeat. She reveals that it exists across multiple dimensions, and therefore all means of defeating it wouldn't work. However, through using the Martial Asterisk, Idea could concentrate the will of all of Crystallica and force the Demon King to exist in this one dimension, granting the party enough time to fight it. As Idea prays, the party prepares to do battle with the Demon King. Oh yes, did I forget to mention that Demon King is the direct translation term for the ball? In this case specifically, Ball the First, Turtle Dove. The party continues the battle and slays the ball in the end, but shortly after they come across the Crystal Guards. Their thirst was never to defeat the Demon King. The ball had rewritten their codes surrounding the Devil attribute to make them become Demon Kings. But before the fight can begin, the mysterious man arrives to deny their plan, along with Kamer. A second battle ensues, and eventually all five are defeated, with only G still slightly alive. The man speculates that the models of the guards being righteous people may have aided in making these demon kings beatable. As G disappears, she wishes she had a real name instead of GMF0000. Kamer suggests Liatris, a kind of flower, and she accepts it before passing. The copy Magnolia also begins to disappear with her job being complete, but not before leaving Adia with a message. Waiting. She remembers that there are others still waiting for her out there, but when she turns to Alternus to thank him for his help, he is gone. Afterwards, the people begged for Adia to return to the position of Wind Vestal, and because of her success, the only punishment she was given after her coup was having to deal with all of the paperwork. 
She wonders why the man had a box to give her, or how she knew how to call upon the martial asterisk, but those were mysteries for another day. <laughs>